Welcome to Functional Medicine Foundation's podcast, where we explore root cause medicine, engage in conversation with functional and integrative medicine experts, and build community with like-minded health seekers. I'm your host, Amber Warren. Let's dig deeper. to Functional Medicine Foundation's podcast. Um, I'm your host, Amber Warren, and I'm back here with Dr. Mark Holthouse, one of my favorite people to interview. And we have a very exciting conversation um, really surrounding busting the myths regarding hormone replacement therapy. Um, so I think we should just dig right in. Let's not let's not sugarcoat anything let's, or beat yeah. around the bush. Let's, let's go for it. Um, so I've heard you give this talk probably like 10 times now. Yeah about sorry no it's amazing i'm so invigorated every time i hear it um the amount of hours i mean we could even probably say days if not weeks worth of time that you have spent digging into the research really over the last year on how you as a physician that specializes in in women's hormones um has just changed your whole approach i so have let's and, go. you know it's it's humbling because you realize that when you think you've got a stance on something mm -hmm that you're there and that's what the ground that, that you defend. And in medicine, what is it? The doubling times every 18 months, it's ridiculous. So any um, dreams of keeping up is, is really just that it's a dream. You can only really delve into an area or two and, and be somewhat qualified to speak. What's interesting though, is that my opinions on, on hormonal therapy, uh, you've known me for three years, have, have completely changed. Um, the evolution began with looking into some of the studies preparing for a talk that I'm doing next month. And um, it, it led me down a, a, a course of, wait a minute, that's not true, as I was hearing things and reading things. And then you just go down the rabbit hole. It's, it's inevitable, and you have to defend. You of, often start trying to defend your, your pet held belief. Mm -hmm. And you end up going, oh, my goodness. There's a lot of data that, that really dis is disruptive mm -hmm. to my, my line of thinking, which was ever so comfortable. And um, so, yeah, the crux of, of my realization has really been hormone therapy is very different from what we've been preaching as hormone therapy with, with synthetics. And synthetics are dangerous, and they cause breast cancer and heart attacks and Alzheimer's and blood clots and pulmonary, pulmonary emboli versus the natural products, the actual non-patentable hormones mm -hmm. that are natural, extracted from yams, and we don't see those things causing those problems. In fact, we see very positive results, and that, that's really what's changed. Can you break down, not to interrupt you, sorry, but what's a synthetic hormone? Ah. that's out there that we could be prescribing. So a synthetic is something like Provera. Provera has um, got a big, long, fancy name. And what drug companies have done is taking they take the idea of a, a biological molecule that's active at a receptor, like natural progesterone, and they have to modify it in order to be able to patent it so that they can make profits. Everyone asks me, well, why did they do that? Why didn't they just use the natural one that prevents these cancers? And and um, and things, uh, and and it's all about money. Yeah. So synthetics are those things that were made in a lab, mm -hmm. and that were changed from their original natural state. Like birth control. Like birth control pills. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't have a bioidentical or uh, non-synthetic form of birth control. Mm -hmm. Even our IUDs with progesterone have progestins, which are synthetic progesterones, mm -hmm. and ironically, they act completely different in human bodies mm -hmm. than do the natural products that they're supposed to replicate. And that, that's really the irony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's all too often that we're seeing patients, you know, hormonal acne, hormonal headaches, um, you know, m mood dysfunction that's, that's cyclical and related to hormones. And they're just slapped with the birth control and, exactly. and they get better. Exactly. But then no one's really talking to them about how that disrupts hormonal balance and how that just shuts down your own you know, right. endogenous hormonal production. And then also what it does to gut health and a lot mm -hmm. of other things too. Right. There's a price to be paid. It seems like every time we monkey with the natural version, mm -hmm. what seems like a, a great outcome often ends up later being a disaster, yeah. which was yeah. the Women's Health Initiative 
20 years ago. So. so that's really the crux of it, right? That's the fear and even the training that a lot of us got in our training programs on why we should be so scared of prescribing hormones. Exactly. July 2002, front cover of Time magazine, why your hormones might be killing you. Mm -hmm. And so we've had 20 years, a whole generation of women mm -hmm. completely scared off of their hormone therapy in menopause. Why? Because the, the synthetics caused breast cancer. They caused heart attacks, strokes, clots, blood pressure problems, Alzheimer's disease. And the doctors during my generation, we were trained the same way. So we've all been trained based on the WHI data on synthetics. And we don't see those findings at all with the bioidentical hormones. A lot of the studies in Europe where they didn't use Premarin and Provera don't have these outcomes. And so we're really recovering from the, the PTSD, if you will, mm -hmm. of the last 20 years of misinformation mm -hmm. and really a, a, a misallocation of these synthetics causing these diseases and applying it to natural hormones, which it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. What's amazing is that in um, JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, 2020, a um, group of uh, hardcore research scientists went back and looked at all this data from those clinical trials. And what they found was that when you left this toxic synthetic progesterone out, there was a significant decrease in breast cancer incidence and mortality, dying from breast cancer, versus when the progesterone was put back in a bigger increase in, in incidence of breast cancer. Not so much the dying from it, but the incidence of breast cancer was significantly higher. We never heard about that. Yeah. That didn't make headline news. It wasn't yeah. a negative story, yeah. which often tends to be less sensationalistic. Uh, but it's out there. Yeah. It's in print. Yeah. And um, it's time to get the word out yes. that if we use the right type of hormone, yeah. which the human body makes that's not synthetic, we can actually help to stave off some of these diseases. Um, we have some of our expert advisory panels mm -hmm. that are still stuck in that kind of fear-mongering yeah. from the 20-year-old data. Yeah, that's so unfortunate. Well, and we live in a world where it is, you know, people are still so <clears throat> so heavy. So we, we as practitioners, we have to be really careful. And so yeah. it is sometimes hard to step out and branch out and get outside of what majority of our colleagues are doing. Yeah. So that it's, it's, a, it's a tough battle. Yeah. Um, Let's start with perimenopausal women, um, maybe because I'm one of them, so I'm excited to dive into this topic a little bit. But I think, again, let's go back to our training, right? We're kind of trained that hormonal, especially in functional medicine, um, hormonal imbalances in premenopausal women are usually due to some other issue, right? Mm -hmm. Nutrient deficiency, stress, poor gut health, poor detoxification, toxins in general. Mm -hmm. And those are all true, Yes, but it's really not the whole story. It's a very short-sighted way of looking at premenopausal hormonal dysfunction. Yes, it, it is. So what are you what are you using mm -hmm. premenopausally and what are you not using? So it's amazing. Uh, when you really understand what's happening before menopause, um, women lose their testosterone about 10 years before menopause mm -hmm. for the most part. Between age 20 and 40, about 45, 50% of it's gone and there's this rapid decline, much quicker actually than guys who lose it much slower over many years, mm -hmm. starting at about age 30. The next thing that goes is progesterone in, in premenopause. <coughs> and lastly is estrogen mm -hmm. when you hit menopause. So knowing, knowing just that, when you have someone that's coming at 35, 38, that's had a couple kids, mm -hmm. who has no sex drive, who's tired, who's starting to put on weight, who's not sleeping well, wouldn't it be wonderful to avoid the antidepressants? Yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful to avoid the addictive sleeping medications? Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful for them to feel completely female again and have a libido? And enjoy raising children and enjoy this really exciting, fun time in our lives and not feel so overwhelmingly exhausted by it all. Exactly. I'm there. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, so, you know, I guess I've, I've, after looking at the data on the safety of testosterone in women, even premenopausally, yeah. 
Um, it, it's amazing when you use these things. Yeah. The route of delivery, mm-hmm. selecting the right patient, right. and the dose is, is where the devil is in, the de- in those details. Right. Can be life changing. Yeah. And um, so that's probably the, one of the biggest areas. Progesterone's life changing yeah. in, in that same age group, whether it's cyclic, whether it's continuous. Progesterone's amazing for postpartum depression. Yeah. It's amazing for cyclic migraines, mm-hmm. PMS, mm-hmm. painful periods, heavy periods, cramping. You know, leave the Motrin in the bottle. Yeah. Um, so there's there's some botanicals we can use before getting to. Are you seeing side effects in some of these premenopausal women using using progesterone? I, you know, I don't. Okay. Uh, progesterone is is just such a natural, uh, wonderfully. Women love their progesterone. Yeah. It makes them sleep at night. They take yeah. it right before bed. Yeah. It's it's something that when it hits the liver, taking it orally, creates this this GABA effect, which is very zen. Yeah. So it helps them get restful, restorative sleep. It also helps to stimulate bone growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, estrogen has a more passive role in bone maintenance, where testosterone and, and progesterone really build bone. Yeah. Uh, great for the brain, mm-hmm. uh, acute brain inflammation. We're learning so much about neuropeptides, and progesterone mm-hmm. is really at the forefront of that. Yeah. So if you can look at migraine sufferers, PMS, yeah. dysphoria, uh, mood issues that are occurring in these heavy periods, painful periods, yeah. clots, you know, yep. they're just miserable. Yeah. And with an oral progesterone two weeks out of the month, it can literally change their lives. And let's, we don't even have to really go the cost saving measures with healthcare in general. If you're saving patients on some of those really expensive pharmaceuticals, right? Um, the antidepressants, the, the migraine medications, and just using, because it's generic. Progesterone's generic. It's cheap. Right, like you don't have right. to get the controlled release version. It's it's really it's, affordable. It's great. You know, yeah. and the SSRIs, yeah. antidepressants, which are first line for PMS, mm-hmm. what do they cause? Number one side effect, sexual dysfunction. Yeah. So it just adds to the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're, they're problematic for the mitochondria. Yeah. Um, so it's it's been life-changing for many women. Yeah. Progesterone's huge premenopausally. Testo is something newer in, in my right. armamentarian of things to try. And again, selecting the women the right way is, is key. So testosterone deficiency, again, we're still talking about premenopausal women. Mm-hmm. What symptoms are you seeing? You mentioned some of them. Right. Mostly it's it's weight gain, okay. uh, usually increased visceral fat, yep. which will drive down HDL cholesterol. You'll often see prediabetes, high insulin. Mm-hmm. You'll see glucose creeping up, prediabetes. Yeah. Um, they have horrific libido issues, yeah. energy, mm-hmm. um, cognitive issues. Often you'll see just brain fog. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times we focus on adrenal and we forget sometimes that when we move away from optimal testosterone, optimal progesterone levels at 40, yeah. we start feeling it. Yeah. Symptoms of androgen insufficiency start in the 30s yeah. in, in most women. And that's not something I was trained as a family practitioner to even talk about. Yeah. It was taboo. Yeah. Um, so lots of data showing it's safe. Uh, we need more long-term studies, definitely. For sure. Most of the hormone studies on T have been done in guys. Yeah. Historically. Yeah. So. What's your favorite mode of delivery for these women that need that need T? Uh, the ones that are looking at needing T that we select and we, we do the risk-benefit little equation with, uh, pellets are by far my, my bias. Mm-hmm. Uh, pellets have been around for 80 years, mm-hmm. very safe. They've never been recalled mm-hmm. for any reason. There's no studies showing that cause clots, yeah. uh, diabetes, stroke, breast cancer. In fact, there's lots of data. Uh, Rebecca Glasser, who's uh, probably a world mo- one of the foremost world-renowned uh, surgical breast oncologists, mm-hmm. publish, has published ferociously on the effects of actually treating breast cancer with testosterone. So cool. Um, so we're not to the point where we can say we can use tea yeah. to prevent breast cancer. Yeah. Um, but it wouldn't blow my mind to, to see that in the next few years. So cool. We saw this with men with prostate cancer. We've come full circle. Yeah. Tea causes prostate cancer. Yeah. Now we see that the guys that are lowest in tea have yeah. the higher risk yeah. of prostate cancer. 
and they present at a higher stage when they come in with it, and they often have more cardiovascular disease yeah. as well. Yeah. Completely the opposite, so wild. you know, of what we've been taught for 70 years. Yeah. And the, the pellet therapy you're using, isn't it, and I'm not trained in pellets, but isn't it more similar uh, physiologically to how our own how our own hormones it are is. modulated? It is. The, the pellets system? are basically compressed natural hormone extracted from a yam. Right. And the powder is compressed into, a, for women, a rice-sized pellet. Cool. And we put it in the top of their glute mm -hmm. cheek every four months. It's a very minor procedure. Yeah. And all natural. Mm -hmm. The pellets aren't FDA approved, but the compounding pharmacies where they're made are heavily FDA inspected. Yeah. So very, very safe. And what's nice is exactly what you said. Instead of getting a roller coaster ride like you see with injections, yeah. you get more of a physiologic effect. There are no FDA-approved testosterone preparations for women. Mm -hmm. There's one that's just come out in Australia. Mm -hmm. So we're stuck using stuff that we use for guys, which is the topical creams, gels, right. injectable, or pellets. And yeah. my, my results in the gals that come back, um, pellets have been just amazing. Yeah. I've seen uh, testosterone in my women work really well for depression. Mm -hmm. I've got some of my most depressed patients. Yeah. They've made pretty significant turnarounds. One of the well, the only indication right now by the Endocrine Society for pre, for women is really what they call hypoactive sexual desire disorder, right. which is low libido. Yeah, female androgen insufficiency is easy to diagnose. It's yeah. not even based on a lab level. Yeah, everyone wants to have my level checked. Well, yeah. it's it's a symptom diagnosis. Right, it's based on basically low libido mm -hmm. and mood symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so incredibly helpful for mood. Mm -hmm. um, so mood, libido, weight loss, body composition improvement, yep. cool. energy, cognition, sleep. Bone health. Uh, bone health, mm -hmm. huge, mm -hmm. uh, for helping to stave off bone loss. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Again, looking upstream, right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's not keep just treating something when we're diagnosed with it. Let's prevent it. Exactly. We don't have that diagnosis and carry that diagnosis anymore. Right, right. Um, so that we do, we did a great job with premenopausal. Let's move into peri, that, that that period of time when you've got the crazy hormonal fluctuations. Yeah. Um, what are what are you seeing there? What are you using? What yeah. are you finding most helpful? Uh, again, testosterone for the same reasons okay. in that age group. What's different in perimenopause? They're tricky little devils. <laughs> there, there's a there's a, a, a very little known um, hormone called inhibin, which is made by the testicle and guys, ovaries and gals. And it starts to crash a little bit around that 40s, 45, close to 48 on average. And its job normally when it's around is to provide negative feedback to the pituitary on something called FSH, which tells the ovaries, make more estrogen. So when you lose inhibin and you, you take that brake pedal off, FSH goes through the roof from the pituitary because you keep trying to make, you're like, oh my gosh, make exactly. it, make it, make it. Yeah. So you end up with, with a scenario called estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. So estrogen dominance really rules mid-30s on to 40s, 50s. So the big mistake that's tempting for providers to step in is to say, oh my gosh, you're 42, you've got hot flashes. It must be low estrogen. Yeah. And so what do they do? They, they start thinking about that. When in fact they've got estrogen dominance, yeah. which with this wild FSH level, yeah. telling the ovaries, bombarding, make more, make more, make more, and they feel horrible. They go, they go nuts. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at FSH levels and really make sure that they've come up, yeah. sh indicating that the ovary is no longer responsive mm -hmm. to all that excess message from the brain mm -hmm. to do that. So it's a real art to knowing where they are based on labs, right. coupled with symptoms. Right. Labs are probably the least important thing premenopausally. Mm -hmm. They become very important, not so much estrogen and progesterone, but the other things like FSH yeah. in those late 40s. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, it's, a, it's a transition, and every woman is different. Yep. When they flip, when that ovary's going on permanent strike, and then often with estrogen deficiency, you see the horrific hot flashes, the night sweats, the sleeplessness. Yeah. 
you know, the cognitive issues, the vaginal dryness, the, the libido is completely changes. gone. Skin's yeah, my changing. Women, they're, they're so upset about their skin. Yeah, skin, yeah. skin's getting creepy and yeah. dry and, and um, saggy, and collagen is just not working in their favor anymore. Right. Their hair's falling out. It's coarse. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this is the lot. And, you know, my, my position has always been very typical where you give the smallest amounts, and this is a good segue for your next post meadow yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. Give the smallest amounts of hormones for the shortest period of time. And, and go that's, really slow. And go really very, slow. Very, very tedious about higher doses. Right. What? <laughs> and this is the ACOG American College of OBGN guidelines. The North American Menopause Society, NAMS, is much more pr- progressive, especially in their 22 just released statement, where there's much more of a, a shared decision making now. They're, uh, they're realizing, wow. Yeah. Gals with low sex drive that have bone loss, this probably is the best therapy, is good old hormones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but <clears throat> we've still got those fears based on old studies 20 years ago yeah. using th- synthetics that somehow these natural products are also going to cause cancers, right? which just isn't true yeah. when you look at the data. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're really individualizing care based on a perimenopausal woman based mm-hmm. on those one to two, maybe three years that she's going through those changes. Exactly. Okay. Um, post. Post. Which is probably one of the bigger. Whoa. Yeah. Yes, Stars. yes. So postmenopausal is interesting. Again, um, my change, my evolution, my metamorphosis, full transparency uh, was if you need them because of symptoms and your hot flashes are not manageable, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. And only for 10 years, mm-hmm. like, you know, at 10, six, age 60, arbitrarily, it's it's not a good idea, based, again, on older studies looking, looking at synthetics. Right. When you look at the estrogen, natural estrogens, and natural progesterone studies, there really isn't data mm-hmm. showing that we need to stop at 60 and 70. Why? Because we know that when we do that, mm-hmm. the benefits to the brain, the breast, the cardiac diseases... And the bone health, a lot of those things immediately revert back to a negative situation. Mm-hmm. Women catch up with guys within five to ten years on their rates of heart disease mm-hmm. right after estrogen's gone. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm thinking, why would I want to withhold something that has that much benefit? Mm-hmm. I, I don't. Do no harm. Do no harm. Do no harm. And to do no harm is to select my patient appropriately, mm-hmm. who doesn't have active blood clots, who doesn't have breast cancer, yeah. who doesn't have a contraindication to it, and give them the benefits of a natural product, not a synthetic where we know harms, right. but a natural product where we know we've got great data on reducing mm-hmm. breast cancer mortality and, and risk. And you, you still feel the data is really strong that those first zero to five years is when you get the most brain cardiovascular bone benefits you yeah. still agree with that yeah i yeah. do i think that first 10 years, 10 years the okay. sooner you can start from the onset of menopause to age 60 yeah that is definitely the sweet spot yep. nobody argues that any, anymore at all good yeah you know a lot of us that are um, in integrative hormone therapy would argue that we shouldn't be stopping at 60 yeah that we should be continuing to treat yeah. regardless of whether or not they've got hot flashes any longer because of the data showing that when we stop, a lot of these other risks come back up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And you're using pellet therapy in these women. Yes, I do. I use pellet therapy. Sometimes we'll use transdermal patches mm-hmm. with natural estrogen. You can get it at your regular pharmacy. Yep. Uh, yeah, They're and cheap. we always use oral progesterone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, don't, I don't use progesterone creams. What's the point for the oral over, over creams on the women that are on the estrogen? Yeah, so the oral progesterone is where the data is on protecting the uterus from getting too much exposure to estrogen, Mm -hmm. which could be unopposed, could cause endometrial cancer. Uh, When you use creams, we have really no good data that shows you're protecting that estrogen stimulation of the uterus. Mm -hmm. Um, Using things like saliva, very unreliable. It's always going to overestimate your progesterone levels. Come to find out, progesterone levels are really difficult to accurately assess with blood, dried urine, or saliva. Treating the symptoms makes sense. The data 
is clear that 100 to 200 milligrams of oral progesterone is going to give you that great sleep, mm -hmm. that zen effect, mm -hmm. and it's going to protect your uterus if you're on systemic yeah. levels of estrogen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Managing and following up. We actually, had, as a group of practitioners, uh, had a great study time today where we talked about all the ways that we manage and follow up really closely on these women to make mm -hmm. sure that levels are are um, where we want them to be and exactly. everyone's doing it safely. Doing a risk calculation postmenopausally, you got to do. Yep. You know, um, what's their breast cancer risk? Do they have fibrocystic breast disease? You know, uh, what are their leptin levels? Prediabetes, obesity, all these things drastically improve their or increase their risk of having a bad outcome. Yeah, smoking, alcohol. Smoking, all these things, yeah. Yeah, it's really important. It's, again, mm -hmm. just kind of that functional integrative approach where we cast a wide net and try to Mm -hmm. you know, fix, rebalance the body and look at biomarkers and do all the things. Everyone wants to just do a patch and forget about their gut. It's easy. I know. I can still have my Doritos and slap yeah. on a patch. I'll feel so much better and my health will return and mm -hmm. you know, all the things. Right. That's so good. Any Anything else that we left off? Any other, anything else that's just rocked your world or kind of turned your, your whole clinical approach upside down with what you're learning and what you're digging into? You know, I think just seeing hor natural hormones... Mm -hmm as a friend as opposed to a foe yeah, is, is really the biggest epiphany I love that's, that. that's evidence-based. Yeah. I think we need to stop following magazine covers, emotions, mm -hmm. and media and follow the science. Oh, but that's just the world we live in now. Mm -hmm. it's just, it's Critical just, thinking is near extinction. Oh, and it's heartbreaking. Um, unfortunately, uh, practitioners are not immune to that. Yeah. We follow expert guidelines that are based on pharmaceutical recommendations. Right. Which is, which is sad. I've seen that in my 30-year career creep in. Yeah, I'm sure. That's a change. Yeah. Uh, sure. I was asked earlier today by these guys that are here hosting in my career, what have I really seen that's changed? And that, that's probably one of the biggest things oh, wow. that I've seen. That's significant. Mm -hmm. Cool. You know, evidence-based medicine is defined as randomized clinical trials. Yeah. You know, who are, who's able to afford to fund billion-dollar trials? Yeah. Well, it's the big pharma. Big Pharma, yeah. so true. I'm so proud of you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I it's such an honor of mine to be with you through this like pivotal moment in your career and get to learn from you and just have these conversations with you. It's truly an honor. Um, I like to end each of my talks, you know this, with, with um, a piece of advice related to our conversation that's moved the needle the most for your patient population. What would that be in this setting? Educating them, empowering them mm -hmm. with the science that says they don't have to be afraid of something their body made their whole lives. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, I love that. Mic yeah. drop, boom. <laughs> what else can you say? Enough said. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Holhouse. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Functional Medicine Foundation's podcast. For more information on topics covered today, programs offered at FMF, and the highest quality of supplements, and more, go to funmedfoundations.com.